So the, this, the Zohar, and these ideas that you're talking about of a, like a Jewish supremacy and the call to wipe out the Amaleks and interpreting any potential enemy of the Jews, regardless of which time period they're in, to potentially be the Amaleks and therefore subject to the threat of annihilation and genocide, and uh, viewing non-Jews as demonic. Is that the type of ideology that is fueling rabbis talking to the IDF, for example, telling them that Palestinians aren't even worth your fingernail? Is that yeah, the connection? Absolutely. Like this is the kind of ideology that uh, generates so much terrorism against Palestinians. Because as we know, all this didn't start on October 7th. You have the history of Israel literally being founded on terrorism. Um, and w we see that rhetoric being used from Judaism to justify, for example, when um, West Bank settlers attack Palestinians, commit arson, you know, randomly murder Palestinian children. Um, you know, over 2,000 acts of violence like this, which should be considered terrorism, but they're not described like that in the mainstream media. These acts of terrorism on Palestinians in the West Bank um, are justified on the basis of this religious interpretation. Um, so obviously not all Israelis will accept, you know, that extreme type of interpretation of, of Judaism, but the people who are committing these acts of terror against Palestinians, and they have for years, are inspired by these religious texts, and the rabbis are teaching those texts. Mm. So how can we not talk about those texts? And the thing is that Zionists have, have set the precedent of tying political action and political violence to texts. So they say that, well, look at Al-Qaeda, look at ISIS. They're a problem because they follow the Quran. And that's why we have to be suspicious of all Muslims and all Muslims are potential terrorists because they believe in the Quran and they're reciting the Quran. Mm -hmm. So we have to have that eye of suspicion. And that's how they justified so many of the policies against Muslims, the Islamophobic policies, justifying the uh, countering violent extremism, CVE policies, for example, in the war on terror, not only in the West, but even in Muslim countries, adopting those same standards that if you're a religious Muslim, that means you care about the Quran. And if you care about the Quran, that means you have more potential to commit acts of terror. That was the logic that was used. So you've set the pres precedent and Zionists and neocons were the ones behind this idea. So why wouldn't we have the same calculus for looking at how Jewish violence is connected to Jewish texts? It seems like you either ban any discussion of religious texts in context of uh, political violence, or you don't have a double standard. If you want to talk about Islamic terrorism, quote unquote, and bring in the Quran and bring in Hadith, then we should be able to do the same thing with Judaism. But the problem is these Zionists and people like the, at the ADL, they want this double standard where, fine, we criticize the Quran and Islam, but you don't are not allowed to talk about our text because that's anti-Semitic. So is it because of what you're saying right now and the fact that you're having these types of discussions on college campuses, do you think this is why the ADL has made you a target? That's what I can only assume because there are a lot of people who are criticizing Zionism, Zionist policies. They're going through Israeli politics. They're bringing up, they're literally, you know, going to the ICJ and making a case. Um, but I don't see as many people talking about the Jewish texts and this Jewish religious tradition. And there seems to be a, a sensitivity to that. And, and I can understand where it's coming from, actually. And I can sympathize in a weird way, because uh, if you look at the history of the Jewish people, uh, attacks against Jews predate Zionism, you know, and there has been a type of anti-Semitism uh, directed towards Jews in Europe, for example, and other places. And a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of it is just out of pure hatred and also um, a kind of belief that Jews are backwards in the sense that they're not assimilating. Uh, because if you look back in history, Jews were ghettoized and they were their own communities surrounded by a larger European minority. And this, this a lot of the things that Muslims experience nowadays with, uh, you know, 
people uh, right wing or maybe even in Europe saying nationalistic movement saying that why why don't Muslims assimilate like Muslims believe in Sharia law Muslims believe in covering their women those kinds of stereotypes and attacks um, similar things were directed towards Jews actually um, and it was based on their religious teachings like well they do believe in a religious law as well they do believe in certain practices and gender roles that were not common in Europe especially post enlightenment so that kind of hatred predates, uh, in a sense, Zionism. So it's even more sensitive uh, when you actually do criticize Judaism uh, because of that. But again, it's, it's a double standard. If you're a, a Zionist or, or, or Jewish commentators, Jewish academics criticizing the Quran, trying to connect it to violence, political violence, and pushing this kind of larger agenda, Islamophobic agenda, whether it's to serve endless wars in the Middle East or whatever, then you should by the same token, be fine with Muslims and others critiquing the Jewish texts. The ADL presents themselves as being not just against anti-Semitism, but against anti-black racism, uh, discrimination against the LGBTQ community. You've argued that uh, although they present themselves as being concerned about Islamophobia, that they're actually quite Islamophobic themselves. Can you explain how? Well, their Islamophobia is in the fact that, for example, by characterizing me as a bigot um, and an extremist, what is the basis for that when I'm just expressing Islamic beliefs, you know, standard Islamic beliefs? As a Muslim, I believe in gender roles. Islam is a uh, is a religion where gender roles are built into the, the law, the Islamic law. And if you're a Muslim, you abide by Islamic law in, in your submission to the religion. Um, similarly with homosexuality, Islam condemns homosexuality. And as a Muslim, you have that position. So if I express that position, like that's my belief, if you're saying that that's bigoted, okay, then you're saying that Islam as a religion is bigoted and that it should be banned or it's not allowed in polite society. That's fine, make the rules clear don't pretend like you are tolerant of Islam on the one hand, but you also want Muslims to give up and censor beliefs that don't match with your ideology or your worldview. You can't have your cake and eat it too, right? So that's the problem with, with Western tolerance. Um, you know, their tolerance for Muslims doesn't really extend beyond what they consider to be right and wrong. Muslims in Afghanistan, for example, their women dress in a certain way. They have a certain culture. They have a certain value system. Well, we don't accept that. That's not consistent with our human rights, our definitions. Therefore, we're justified in bombing you, droning you, and forcing you to change. Okay, so how is that tolerance? You know, how is that this enlightened tolerance that you are uh, presuming of yourself? It's all hypocrisy. It's all hypocrisy. And this, especially post October 7th, this idea of tolerance and a rule based order and the West is so concerned with human rights. Everyone has been disabused of that nonsense. Like, OK, now we see what's really going on. It's, this is this is a rule based order when it favors you. But if it's Muslim children being killed, if it's Palestinians being literally starved to death, and your world leaders are complicit and they won't say a word, then you can take your rules-based order and shove it. Trust nothing. No.